Hear this story from the first chapter of the Gospel of John of Jesus calling some of the first disciples. I'm going to begin with verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is a story of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The book, A Beautiful Question, was written and published in 2015 by Nobel physicist Frank Wilczek. Wilczek is a physicist. He's a mathematician. He says his book is a long meditation on this single question. Does the world embody beautiful ideas? Which is in the same family of the more commonly asked question about the world? Does the world have meaning? In an interview with Krista Tippett, Wilczek said that the most important episodes of his scientific career have been driven by a desire to make equations beautiful, as well as a faith in the beauty of the physical world where we live. In the interview, I was particularly struck by these words, his words, I don't even know what it would mean to say what the meaning of the world is. But if we ask the question, does the world embody beautiful ideas, we can get quite far in finding illuminating answers. You see, I noticed this week that I have a similar experience when reading the Gospel of John I hardly even know how to go about telling you the meaning of a passage in this gospel. The gospel of John is poetic and artistic. It's deep. It has layer upon layer upon layer. John reaches back into the Hebrew scriptures and he critiques the first century where he lives and he projects, he seems to project truth into the future that touches my heart. He leaves out what I would consider to be important details. He ends scenes abruptly and jumps to a new location without any explanation. I don't much know how to preach meaning here. But beauty? I think the beauty of the Gospel of John can preach. So hear my reflection this morning, not as a definite answer to the meaning of the verses found at the end of chapter 1 of John, but hear it as an attempt to tell you my experience of what is beautifully significant here. Nathaniel is one of Jesus' disciples. His name isn't found in the other Gospels unless it's Bartholomew, as some have speculated. Nathaniel, John tells us, is from Cana of Galilee. Later on in the gospel, he tells us that, which is close to Nazareth. So Jesus and Nathaniel are from neighboring towns. This passage takes place in Bethsaida, which is right on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. And then Nazareth is 15 miles west of the sea. Nazareth was so small that it does not even appear in Josephus's detailed lists of the villages of Galilee. When I was a, a freshman in high school, 
Time Magazine wrote an article about a high school rivalry, which involved my high school and the high school in the neighboring town. Someone I knew, someone I went to high school with, was in class with every day, was on the cover of Time Magazine, cheering in the stands at the annual football rivalry. Several years after my high school graduation, a book was written about the high school football team from the rival school. I quickly dismissed it. Who cares about Odessa Permian? I'm not reading that. Nothing good could come out of Odessa. Maybe you've heard of the book or the subsequent movie or the television series, Friday Night Lights. That's Odessa, Texas. When Nathaniel says to Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I think he asks the question with playful ridicule and a little disdain. But his friend Philip doesn't let the conversation end there. He says to Nathaniel, come and see. Come and experience the revelation of God for yourself. Preacher James Howell wrote that this come and see is the best example of what it is to witness to our faith. Not speaking or even shouting a sledgehammer of truth, but providing instead an experience of the faith, an experience of the Christ for another person. You know, this takes real time. It takes compassionate effort. It takes heart. When I was an intern at a church the summer after I graduated from college, I had this fear of hospitals that made me dizzy. It really made me lightheaded. When I was a senior in college, I went to pick my grandmother up from her cataract surgery, and there was some doubt as to whether or not I could drive after stepping into the surgical center or if. My grandmother, the patient, would have to drive us both home. (laughs) But the supervising pastor at the church where I was an intern said, hmm, let's go see together a few hospital rooms, and then afterwards we'll reward ourselves with a Dr. Pepper. He was exactly right. I just had to see what was going on in those hospital rooms experience the miraculous work of families and the medical staff, see the healing, the beauty of it all. You know, I'm thankful to my own faith mentors who invited me to come and see God at work as they participated in that work in hospital rooms and sanctuaries, in workspaces and classrooms and homes. The truth of the matter is the places where God is at work, where beauty is at play, these places aren't just for pastors. And the sacred spaces are so many and they are so varied that it is all of ours to join in that work and invite others to come and see. It seems to me that Jesus calls Nathaniel out from under the fig tree. Now, I'm not certain what Nathaniel is doing underneath there. The scripture doesn't tell us. It could be that he is seeking shelter from the sun, or maybe he's gathering figs. Or if he's me, if he's me, he's hiding. Fred Craddock told a story from his own childhood on a farm about playing hide and seek with his brothers and his sister. You remember how to play hide and seek. One person is it. And they hide their eyes and they count to 100. And then they say, ready or not, here I come. And you're supposed to be hidden while the one who is it comes looking and then tries to beat the first one found back to the base. Craddock said that his sister was it, but she cheated. (laughs) Well, she started out, honestly enough. He said she would count one, two, three, four, five, six, 97, 98, 99, 100, ready or not, here I come. So Fred decided to outsmart her. He had a place that was quick to get to and fail safe. She'd never find him. 
While she was counting up on the front porch, he was hiding under the porch steps of the house. So here she came. Ready or not, here I come. She went in the house, out of the house, in the weeds, in the trees, down to the corn crib, into the barn. All the while, Fred was snickering underneath the steps. She'll never find me. She'll never find me. And then it hit him. She'll never find me. So the next time she came by, he stuck out his toe. Because what he really wanted is what we all want, to be found, to be seen. Some biblical scholars will tell you that sitting under a fig tree means studying Torah. And sources that came after the writing of the New Testament use the phrase gathering figs to suggest studying, simply studying. So instead of saying, get back to your desk, Or have you done your homework? I guess we can say to our children, get in there and gather some figs. The reason the rabbis said that gathering figs meant to study is because the tree of knowledge from the garden creation story was believed to have been a fig tree. The scripture doesn't say it, but the scripture does say that the man and woman cover themselves with fig leaves. And all this leads me to believe that the fig tree symbolizes protection, knowledge, authority, security. The fig tree for Nathaniel, I think, is just a security blanket. And Nathaniel is being invited to leave the shade of that tree for greater things. In chapter 1 of John's Gospel, there are many names for Jesus. In the nine verses I read, maybe you picked up on some of them, there is him about whom Moses and the prophets wrote, the son of Joseph from Nazareth, there's rabbi, there's son of God, there's king of Israel, there's son of man. Each person who encounters Jesus sees something different, and this is worth celebrating that there's more to God than one person can describe. But Nathaniel's name for Jesus is worth paying attention to because I think he lands on something significant when he names Jesus. When he calls out, you are the king of Israel, he reminds us that there's only one king. Walter Brueggemann teaches that there is the way of the empire and the way of God. And in the video that we watched just a few minutes ago about discipleship, he calls these two ways the predatory script and the neighborly script. Later on in this gospel at Jesus' trial in front of Pilate in chapter 19, we will hear the cry, we have no king but Caesar. The predatory mob, the chief priests, Those who have some authority in the temple will cry out, We have no king but Caesar. Henry Nouwen was a well-loved religion professor at Harvard and Yale. His lectures would pack university halls, and at the peak of his academic career, he walked away from it. And he went to live in L'Arche community and became a direct care assistant for a young man with severe disabilities who would never read a word of Nowen's books or care at all about his fame in religious circles. In Nowen's later years, he wrote these words about Christian discipleship. The long, painful history of the church is the history of people who are ever and again tempted to choose power over love, control over the cross, being a leader over being led. Those who resist this temptation are our true saints. Now one goes on to say, one thing is clear to me. The temptation of power is greatest to us when intimacy is a threat. Christian empire builders are those who are unable to give and receive love. The predatory script. Unable to give 
and receive love. You know, I think that Walter Brueggemann is right about many things, but when he said in our video, pain and vulnerability is privileged in the gospel, it is privileged in our Bible, that is spot on. I cannot speak with greater clarity or truth because pain is the place, I believe. It's the valued place. It's the sacred place to receive God's messages and God's messengers. Like Jacob's ladder, messengers, God's messengers, angels ascending and descending. The place of vulnerability, the place where threat looms large in our lives is exactly the place where heaven opens wide. I just have to allow myself to be seen, to stick a toe out. Jacob did it. So did Nathaniel and every disciple that followed afterwards. Be seen. Be known. Stick your toe out. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, You are a tremendous artist. You specialize in beauty. We want our lives to be works of art. Where we have pain, would you give us the strength to remain open to love? And where there is pain in the world, allow us to bring compassion and comfort. We seek to follow the ways of your Son, Jesus the Christ, And we pray together as he taught his disciples, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.